optimal minimal. At this altitude, I can run flat out for a half mile before my hands start shaking. Can I answer your personal question? Now we're just seeing a broken time. What if I did the opposite? I'm a cybernetic organism, living tissue over a metal endoskeleton. This episode of the Tim Ferriss Show is brought to you by Athletic Greens. I get asked all the time, if I could only take one supplement, what would it be? The answer is inevitably Athletic Greens. I view it as, and a lot of you now view it as, all-in-one nutritional insurance. I recommended it way back in 2010 in The 4-Hour Body, and I did not get paid to do so. I've been using it since before that. And I use it in a lot of different ways. I travel with it to avoid getting sick or to help mitigate the likelihood of getting sick. I take it in the morning to ensure optimal performance. And overall, it covers my bases if I can't get what I need from whole food meals throughout the rest of the day. And if you want to give Athletic Greens a try, they're offering a free 20-count travel pack for first-time users. I nearly always travel with at least three or four of these one-dose bags. In other words, if you buy Athletic Greens as a first-time buyer, you now get for a limited time, an extra $79 in free product. So check out the details at athleticgreens.com forward slash Tim. Again, that's athleticgreens.com forward slash Tim for your free travel pack with any purchase. This episode is brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs. Hiring can be hard, really hard, and it can also be super, super expensive and painful if you get it wrong. I certainly have had that experience firsthand multiple times, and I am not eager to repeat it. So I try to do as much vetting as possible on the front end. And today, with more qualified candidates than ever, you need a solution. You need a platform that helps you to find the right people for your business. LinkedIn Jobs does exactly that. More than 600 million users visit LinkedIn to learn, make connections, grow as professionals, and more than ever, discover new job opportunities. In fact, Overall, LinkedIn members add 15 new skills to their profiles and apply to 35 job posts every two seconds. That's a crazy stat. LinkedIn does the legwork to match you to your most qualified candidates so that you can focus on the hiring process, getting the person into your company who will transform your business. They make sure your job post gets in front of the people with the right hard skills and soft skills to meet your requirements. They've made it as easy as possible. So check it out. To get $50 off of your first job post, go to linkedin.com slash Tim. Again, that's linkedin.com slash Tim to get $50 off of your first job post. Terms and conditions apply. But check it out, linkedin.com slash Tim. Hello, boys and girls. This is Tim Ferriss, and welcome to another episode of The Tim Ferriss Show, where it is always my job, each and every episode, to speak with a world-class performer. And today, performer, I suppose, is very literal in a lot of respects. And uh, this wide-ranging conversation will involve my guest, Dita Von Teese. Dita Von Teese is the biggest name in burlesque in the world since Gypsy Rose Lee, who was born in 1911. Dita is credited with bringing the art form back into the spotlight. She is renowned for her iconic martini glass act and dazzling haute couture striptease costumes adorned with hundreds of thousands of Swarovski crystals. This burlesque superheroine, as she's been called by Vanity Fair, is the performer of choice at high-profile events for designers such as Marc Jacobs, Christian Louboutin, you'll have to excuse me for my French, Louis Vuitton, Chopard, and Cartier, among others. She's the author of the New York Times bestseller, Your Beauty Mark, subtitle, The Ultimate Guide to Eccentric Glamour, and has a namesake lingerie collection available internationally at prominent retailers. She can be found on the socials, on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, at Dita Von Teese, D-I-T-A-V-O-N-T-E-E-S-E. Dita, welcome to the show. Thank you. And I have wanted to meet for so long... Amanda Palmer first piqued my curiosity, and uh, there's so many directions we could go, but I thought we would start with a word, haute couture, which, <laughs> which we started to talk about a little bit because I didn't know what it meant. What mm-hmm. is haute couture? 
Well, I mean, it's like a term that's used very loosely these days. Everyone wants to call it something haute couture if it's like extra special, but it really means high sewing, like a high level of sewing. And so when you talk about a haute couture designer, it's, you know, there's like a ministry of haute couture in France where you kind of get the stamp and you can call your clothing haute couture. So it's kind of loosely used, you know, you'll find like haute couture donuts and things like that, you know, <laughs> but it's really not accurate. So I always say that I do, you know, haute strip. So it's like a high level of strip, but, you know, wearing haute couture costumes, which means they're, you know, made with the, with extravagance and excellence that is not, you know, something you can buy in a store. So speaking of things that you can't buy easily, in a store because you forged your own path in a lot of respects. I would like to take a 90 degree turn, I suppose, from where most people would expect me to go and talk about uh, vintage cars. So it's my understanding okay. that you've done very well in collecting, flipping, refurbishing vintage cars. Yes. Where does that come from? Well, it first started in the early 90s. I was big into the swing dance scene and pin up, you know, a pin up model. And um, I had a boyfriend that drove a 1930s car. And I sort of thought I should have a 1930s car. So I got my first uh, car in 1939 Chrysler New Yorker when I was in my early 20s. And um, I love that car, and I used to drive it all around Orange County where I lived. And I didn't, I didn't, um, I sold that car not that long ago, maybe like 10 years ago. And I bought it for like $8,000 in the 90s and sold it to someone in Germany for like $30,000. So I thought, this is kind of, I should do this more. So I started buying more cars. I met a really great guy that helps me with my cars. And so he goes to all the auctions and finds things at a good price. And then we fix it up. I drive it for a while because also for me with vintage cars, I like cars from the 30s, 40s and 50s. But with vintage cars, there's kind of, it's like a relationship. I've had cars that I had a bad relationship with, like the brakes going out. And, uh, you know, there's a I had this 65 Jaguar S type for a while that I loved. It was so beautiful. I actually bought it on eBay while I was drinking red wine and taking Ambien, which was probably not the best <laughs> idea. But so I picked up this car and I, it was so beautiful. Um, I picked it up when I was sober. It was still beautiful. I was glad I bought it, but it was not a good fit for me because the brakes kept going out on this car. And you could imagine that's it's, really terrifying. Yeah, it sounds like a downside. One moment in particular that I remember was I was pulling up to the Playboy Mansion. And, you know, this is like in the 90s when it was like these amazing parties happening. And I remember going up the hill and knowing the brakes were starting to fail and just leaning out the window to all the valets brakes don't work and they all ran and you know I was going up the hill quite slowly at that point but all these like valley guys running in their red coats to stop the car so uh, and then I just got out went to the party and you know had the car taken care of the next day but it was one of those things where I couldn't get I kept taking it to mechanics and they were like the brakes are fine the brakes are fine and then I'd get in it again and then they go out on me so um I feel like you have to have the right fit with a vintage car. And so I, I buy them, I drive them, and I decide if it's the car for me or not. Like, do I, is it easy for me to drive? Do I love how it feels to drive it? Does it leave me on the side of the road or not? And so I've kind of just, right now I have uh, three cars. I have a 1953 Cadillac that I've had for a long time, a Fleetwood. Uh, I've had that one for a while, and I love that one. And I have um, a 1940 La Salle, which is a Cadillac. It's a convertible, like a big black gangster car. Really beautiful, but I don't drive it that much. Uh, and then I just bought a car. It's called a Woodhill Wildfire. And it's a convertible. It looks like the Disney Cars car. So I bought that one actually to flip it because it's super, super rare. And it's not really the kind of car that I can cruise around LA in because it'll be like a really, you know, it'll go to Pebble Beach for sure next year. Hmm. So I'll drive it for like a year. I'm having it all done up and then I'll take pictures in it, drive it, enjoy it. And then, you know, flip that one. Now is part of the ability to flip these cars associated with the fact that you have driven them or is that a selling point or is that, it, is that not part of the selling process? I think it's a little bit of both. I feel like vintage cars are one of those things. If you can keep them for a long time, they will always retain their value. It's just, you have to not be desperate to sell it. 
mm-hmm. and you can always turn a profit. But yeah, like having, you know, the pictures or video or, you know, me getting photographed with it, um, that's, you know, but I don't just buy them and take pictures of it and then sell it. You know, right. I really use them. I really love them, you know. And you, you collect or you have collected other things, or I should say uh, vintage cars are not the only vintage that you've acquired in the past. No, I mean, I pretty much collect dead people's things <laughs> all, of all kinds. My house is like a museum. I am a maximalist. I love, um, I, I like recyclables too. I like vintage clothing because it's another thing that retains its value. Uh, I started wearing vintage um, when I was just out of high school. Um, I graduated from high school in 1990 and I bought vintage clothes because I couldn't afford anything else and I kind of wanted to get the designer look you know I could emulate designers like Vivian Westwood or Jean-Paul Gaultier by buying like vintage bullet bras when you could buy them for nothing and so I started like that because I couldn't afford like you know the, the designer jeans my friends in Orange County had or the cool sneakers so I kind of like went to flea markets and went to vintage stores and then you know lo and behold all these years later it's super collectible and I have amassed an amazing collection of vintage clothing that has really uh, has a lot of value <laughs> it's amazing how that works uh and it makes me think of like my my habits and hobbies with comic books as a kid. I mean, I didn't mm-hmm. acquire them to have them appreciate in value. Uh, but like you said, lo and behold, it's how kind of a, a life lesson, right? Like if you do things with authenticity, like that's what I've always retained from there's, it's like a common thing of all of my life lessons is like things that are authentic. If you do it in an authentic way, you know, like what I never said, I'm going to be the world's most famous person burlesque star i'm going to be a stripper in the modern times i just did it accidentally Mm -hmm. and it's the same thing with collecting you know with the cars and the vintage clothes it was sort of like i just loved it and then i'm lucky that it all worked out so we're we're gonna we're gonna look at 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 luck and we're gonna look at decisions i think they Mm -hmm. go hand in hand very often you have maybe not equal doses of each but certainly doses of each let's let's talk about burlesque um, but we're gonna mm-hmm. we're gonna do it kind of hopping backwards and forwards the first question that i wanted to ask is about the name so dita von Teese, where does the name yeah. come from <laughs> what's the backstory on the name well it's funny that one time i i remember a few years back someone was talking a journalist said how cliche my name was how calculated and cliche it was but it wasn't at all so i was working in a strip club in the early 90s uh in orange county And I had picked the name Dita because I had just seen a movie with an actress called Dita Parlow. And then there was also like the Madonna character in the sex book. And I kind of was, you know, into this 20s look at the time. I kind of went through different eras that I loved and emulated that. So um, I picked the name Dita. And uh, and then a few years later, I was uh, asked to be in these Playboy newsstand specials. I don't know if some people remember this, that, but they used to have always these special magazines called the Book of Lingerie or whatever. So I was in those in like the mid 90s and they told me I had to have a second name. So and I said, no, why? Madonna, Cher, Dita, what? And they said, no, you have to have a second name. So I opened up the phone book because we used to have yellow pages back then or white pages. And I was like, people with a Vaughn are cool in their name. So I looked under the Vons and I found this name Vaughn Treese, T-R-E-E-S-E. And I called Playboy and I said, I'm going to be Dita Vaughn Treese. And they're like, okay. (laughs) And then I remember the magazine came out and I went to the liquor store and I grabbed my issue and I opened it up and said Dita Vaughn Tees. They forgot the R. And now I wouldn't think anything like, oh, this is cool. It's like strip tees, Dita Vaughn Tees. I thought I need to call them and tell them you know, give them what for. And so I called them and, and said, it was supposed to be Dita Von Trees. And they said, yeah, yeah, we'll correct it next month. So, uh, you know, the magazine came out again and it said Dita Von Tees. So it just kind of, I just kind of left it. And I didn't think ever for one minute that I was going to be famous with that name or I was going to be trademarking it internationally. I would have probably done it differently if I had known that it was going to turn into what it has. So it seems to have worked out. <laughs> yeah. But I was just, you know, I was just like working in a strip club do it, posing for these Playboy magazines and, you know, it was something I thought I thought I would just, you know, 
get married, you know, have a baby, and like that would be my past of being this pinup star and, and stripper. Well, it's, it seems to me that there's there's an argument that people can make uh, for planning big, thinking big, and making those decisions with this really long-term outlook. Mm -hmm. But I think there's also an argument that could be made if you look at a lot of the people who have been on this podcast, that if they knew then what they knew later, they would have fucked it all up by trying to sort of craft themselves for the world. And they would have lost that authenticity or that spontaneity that is actually kind of the genie in the bottle that helped them to do what they did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, what is burlesque and how did that enter the scene? Because my understanding in, in doing the research and also uh, you very generously contributed uh, your answers to Trava Mentors is that ballet was one of the I guess, first focal points. So how did burlesque enter the picture? And what is burlesque? <clears throat> yeah, okay. So I wanted to be a ballerina my whole childhood, I, but I was just not really that good at it. I just loved it. And still to this day, it's like, I like to take a ballet class, but I'm the ballerina in the back and I have to follow everyone. And I just never had that, like, I was just not naturally meant to do that, you know? But I loved it. Um, so burlesque uh, was a type of show that was sort of a spin-off of a vaudeville show back in, you know, the 1930s and 40s. So vaudeville was kind of like where a lot of, you know, amazing comedians and singers kind of made their mark in America in the 1920s and 30s and you know, pretty much it was dead by the 40s, but so burlesque was kind of the naughtier cousin <laughs> of vaudeville. It was a little bit more about sex. It was like working man's entertainment cheaper ticket um you could go and see well actually originally it meant it was kind of just a variety show but this the stars of the burlesque show kind of became the strippers and it was kind of by an accident you know they say there was like a dancing girl there's a few different there's different folklore for how it actually started how burlesque in america really started that idea of strip tease to music with a band or on stage um there was one story about a girl who was trying to do a quick change and she started like pulling off her outfit before she was concealed from the audience and they went crazy. And so, you know, in those days it was like, well, you know, what can you do to get, make a name for yourself? So obviously that turned into like a striptease act. Um, but yeah, it was kind of like the strip club of that time, but it, you know, there was a live orchestra band and you had comedy and uh, dancing girls but you know you had great stars that came out of burlesque like Gypsy Rosalie who a lot of people compare me to or compare my career to she was the uh, subject of the musical and film Gypsy uh, starring Natalie Wood which came out in the 60s so burlesque was kind of a uh, very niche entertainment I think I don't think it's ever it, of course it went away you know it got the burlesque theaters got shut down uh, in the 50s, and then burlesque dancers like Lily St. Cyr uh, were performing in uh, like supper clubs and, and whatnot. Um, but burlesque was kind of dead by the 50s in a lot of ways. And so it's dead in the 50s, and yet somehow it finds you. Yeah. Uh, or you find it. And you were born in the working class rural Michigan. Is mm -hmm. that right? Yes. Okay. I was so. born in Rochester, but I grew up in a place called West Branch, Michigan, which is near Traverse City. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so how did burlesque or striptease or any of those uh, forms of entertainment or those, those iconic women enter your life? Well, I had this idea in, in around 1991 that I wanted to be the new Betty Page. I wanted to create pinup pictures with the emphasis on bondage and fetishism because I kind of got introduced to that world in a roundabout way um, through my job working in a lingerie store. Okay. I worked in a lingerie store. I love, I, I've been obsessed with lingerie since I was a little girl. Like I have really distinct memories of being curious about what these weird things that women wore under their clothes were like bras. I used to sneak into my mom's bra drawer and I used to steal things and to me, it was like symbolic of womanhood and femininity. And I was like, I want to be part of this world. <laughs> you know, so I was always obsessed with lingerie. Um, anyway, I became obsessed with like 
things like garter belts, stockings when I was a teenager. I worked in a lingerie store. I asked someone for, um, I, I'd been looking for like a Victorian corset and someone gave me this, gave me this address uh, when I was like 18 and I walked into the store where they, I supposedly could get something like that and it was a fetish store. And it kind of opened my whole my mind to this whole other world that I had no idea existed. And I was shown this picture of Betty Page, and I thought, why isn't anyone doing this now? And I decided I was going to be that. And so, in the progress, you know, the process of me um, making all these pinup pictures and even bondage movies and all these things that were from that, you know, in a fifties theme. Um, I f- would be looking at these vintage magazines and a lot of the, the models that pose for these vintage magazines or these fetish magazines that would say they were a burlesque dancer too. I was like, the burlesque dancer? So a lot of these women that posed for pinups back then in men's magazines in the 30s and 40s, they were also dancers and I thought like oh what a great way to use my failed ballet career you know (laughs) I could I could you know perform on stage and and perform in these vintage you know vintage outfits so I you know my first stages for that were strip club regular strip club and then as I became more famous like with Playboy and everything I would headline the big strip clubs all over the United States and I'd get, you know, then suddenly I, I was the most famous fetish model in the early 90s, too. So I was performing at this, like, torture garden in London and the fetish ball here in L.A. and kind of doing all these, like, fetish parties. Okay. I have so many questions. <laughs> okay. I have so many questions. Thank you for that. Uh, so, so, so the your career and trajectory is so interesting to me on multiple levels. Because, and then I can list off all the reasons, but there's a, there's a, the, the perception that I have is that the, say, strip club or stripping, strip tease world is very, would be very difficult and very competitive because you have a, a lot of beautiful women or beautiful mm-hmm. girls and the, at least in, in some places, I would imagine the, the sort of barrier to entry is 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 decently low, and yet you were able to craft this this unique career for yourself and really differentiate yourself. And I, I want to harken back to uh, something we were chatting about uh, before we started recording, which was you know, Amanda Palmer in I guess the the art of asking, if I'm getting the title right talked about you because she contrasted what you did and feel free to fact correct but (laughs) with a lot of what was happening at the time where you'd have these sort of bleached blonde Mm -hmm. women completely nude you know enormous fake breasts doing their thing getting kind of singles or fives and you'd have this elaborate long strip tees Mm -hmm. with much more clothing Mm -hmm. and then there was one guy who would give you a 50 and it was like that guy's your customer yeah so which which to me is so beautiful because uh and i'm gonna read a, a a quote here if, if I may, this is from your answer in Tribe of Mentors. If you could have a gigantic billboard anywhere with anything on it, what would it say and why? And the quote that you gave was, you can be a juicy ripe peach and there will still be someone who doesn't like peaches. And I'll, I'll just finish this real quickly. This is a quote that my friend's great grandmother told to her and she told to me and I've always loved it. And you go on to say how in the public eye as a burlesque star, you've been called brilliant, stupid, ugly and beautiful in equal measures. But you found your niche. You found mm. your true believers. How did you do that? Like, when did you realize that it could work? Was there a, that's a very long-winded lead up to a question, mm-hmm. but it's like you, you broke through and became so big in a world where I think the, the belief would be that's extremely, extremely difficult. So, what, like, when did you realize, wow, I think I'm on to something or, or you found that, uh, secret sauce. Yeah. Um, I feel like the first thing I think about is that all along I was 
just having fun and enjoying what I was doing, having the time of my life. So it was never high stakes, like, am I going to make it or break it? I didn't really care. I always kept my normal job, you know, what while I was going to strip job? club. Um, first, I worked in lingerie, and then I worked in makeup and beauty behind the makeup counter at Robinson's May. So I kind of always kept my other, my, my, my job. Um, and so it was never... Like, if I don't make it, what am I going to do? Right. I just thought, like, this is fun. So I think not having, like, that pressure. Um, but there's certainly a couple turning points in my career where I mostly felt I had to live up to accolades I was getting suddenly. Like, when I was on the cover of Playboy in 2002 for the Christmas edition, it was still a time when Playboy everybody knew who was on the cover of Playboy and people cared. It was kind of before it was all reality stars and it was when you had like actresses wanting to be on the cover. So it, that was a pivotal moment in my career. And then um, uh, I was in Vanity Fair and they wrote this article about what I did and, and I felt like I better live up to some of this. Um, and that kind of made me take myself more, a little bit more seriously. And then I came out with a book where I told my story, not in an autobiographical way, but a photo book, uh, with Judith Regan. And she kind of let me go wild with this book. And it was the first time that Harper Collins and Regan books had done a book like this, where it was sort of autobiographical, but mostly a photo book. And on one side, it's called Burlesque and the Art of the Tease and Fetish and the Art of the Tease. And it was a, f a book where you could flip it over and read the other side, the, the light side and the dark side. Um, and I found, uh, I did this big book signing in London at Harrods and the night before I went on the Jonathan Ross show. And when I showed up, um, they had blocked off the streets and there were thousands of women there. <laughs> they were, it was like a sea of like girls with red lipstick on and I suddenly went, oh, I didn't know that I'm standing for something now. And I realized that by just telling my story about feeling like I wasn't, um, you know, wasn't very beautiful, wasn't very talented, all these things, it kind of, you know, resonated with other people that said, I felt that way too. And I kind of just felt like I had a mission and something to stand up for and realize that all has to just come from speaking my truth and being authentic and not like calculating because, you know, talking about what we were saying earlier there's so many people that want to be the new me and they're going to be more Dita Von Teese than Dita Von Teese was and they're going to make their career and they're going to be more famous than me and do better than me you know I hear it all the time but it's like you can't really you know you can try to make it up and you can decide you're going to do all those things but I think ultimately you know I'm not like super um spiritual like the universe is watching but I just feel like my whole career path is just a matter of doing something that I loved, that I believed in, but without the desire or want to be famous. Um, I wanted to be acknowledged, certainly, but I didn't expect it. Mm -hmm. when, did you, when did you know you could make it a full-time gig? So I'm thinking about the road leading up to the cover of Playboy. I would imagine a few things happened leading up to that. Uh, when did you end up quitting those backup jobs? I think I ended up quitting those jobs around 2000 and uh, 2000, maybe like right before Playboy. And that's when I was really touring um, and, and shooting pictures. And I also met my ex-husband, Marilyn Manson. A lot of people know me because of him. He's always been a cheerleader for what I do. Um, and still is in a lot of ways. So uh, I think that that was a moment too where I felt like I could focus completely on showbiz instead of um, my paycheck because I was also like, let's be real, I was, you know, basically his cook. I'm a good cook. <laughs> I was sort of like the housewife and took care of him while he was making records. He made a record called The Golden Age of Grotesque, which was sort of a tribute to my world. Mm -hmm. And, you know, around that time, I was sort of, you know, moved in with him. We got engaged and I was, you know, packing his suitcases, unpacking his suitcases, you know, acting like personal assistant half the time, but also had the freedom to, you know, start building, you know, put big props up in, in our backyard and rehearse on them and, and make bigger, better shows. So that was kind of a moment where I could focus more on that. Mm -hmm. You have said that 
uh, the advice. Well, actually, no, I'm going to come back to the advice, not the advice uh, to your younger self, but that your your 16 year old self might be surprised that you've managed to find your voice and that you experienced a lot of fear uh, yeah. as as a kid. Uh, and you do, I mean, just in our interactions leading up to recording, I mean, you, you seem very, in some ways, very introverted uh, yeah. <laughs> or, or, or on the shy side, which is not a bad thing. Uh, how did you find your voice? What changed? Yeah, I mean, I grew up really shy. Like, I remember being in grade school and being sent, by, you know, and I was sort of always confused by this. Um, but they sent me to like a speech class or something like this because I was so soft spoken, but mostly I was just terrified for them to ask me anything or call on me. And I felt that way through high school and everything. Um, I could have never, you know, I used to duck out of speech class, like, or, or, you know, in high school when you'd have to give speeches. Oh, I would never, you know, I never went to theater. I didn't want to be an actress, nothing like that. Um, but I liked, you know, I liked ballet, I liked performing, but that was different. Um, and I, I, I feel like I found my confidence actually with first, it's one of the things I talk about with my book is learning how to find confidence in how I present myself and, and you know, listen, it's, it's, like, it's like drag, the way we dress ourselves, the way we wear our hair, the makeup we wear, I feel more confidence than when I'm, you know, with the character I created, which is not you know, I don't, it's, it's a character, but it's not, (laughs) it's like an aesthetic character, but I'm not, I still find the importance in being still the Heather Sweet from Michigan and the vulnerability coming across, not just Mm -hmm. with the appearance I've created, but on stage with how I perform. Heather Sweet for people who don't know your birth name. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm Heather Sweet. Uh, It sounds like a stripper name. I know (laughs) my, my, uh, yeah. Um, what was I saying? You were talking yeah. about confidence and the yeah. when you put on the, and I'm just paraphrasing here, but mm-hmm. when you put on the persona mm-hmm. that allows you to assume a level of confidence that you don't normally have yeah, access to. Yeah, I felt to. like wearing, um, wearing my makeup a certain way and wearing my clothes that change my posture and make me want to walk proud or people wanting to, wondering who I am. Who's that girl? You know, mm-hmm. it, it slowly but surely helped me gain confidence. And, and of course, there are, I, I feel like it's, it's definitely about maturity too, right? Like we're, you know, when you're in high school, you're a certain maturity level. <laughs> it's just when you think about the science of it too. And I just kind of thought eventually I learned that if I make mistakes in front of people, it, pe- there are people that are all saying, I'm like that too. And it's endearing. So when... Uh, I was a spokesperson for the Mac AIDS Fund for the Mac Viva Glam thing, and I had to give speeches all over the world. And I was so scared, but then I realized that once I got up there and I'd have a have a triumph, it made me have more confidence. And so I love to challenge myself in doing things that terrify me. You know, I I have never been a singer. I cannot sing, but I got asked to make an album by one of the greatest French. Uh, musicians and I thought okay you know I said to him you know I can't sing right and he said this album wouldn't work with a singer (laughs) and I wrote it for you and I thought okay and just the whole process of going into a studio and being in you know around all these like sound technicians and this artist that I admire so much um and like learning and going to that place of feeling like Heather Sweet from Michigan again, I enjoy it and I come out of it, you know, and it's one of the things I think my fans and people that know me like about me is that I'm not trying to like, look to me, I'm so glamorous and I have confidence in everything I do. Like, I don't talk like that. I don't act like that. I, you know, I know how to bring it on stage, but I also know that the little things that are the real me are what make it an interesting thing to watch. Mm-hmm. You, so you mentioned feeling terrified. I, I want to wind back the clock mm-hmm. a bit, and uh, because I, I I deliberately didn't want to kind of fill in the gaps on on some chapters in your life, because I wanted to hear it from you directly. Also, because I can't believe everything you read on the internet. Yeah. Uh, were you? Is it true that you were th- that you were thrown out of your house in high school? Yeah. Or- well, my parents were getting a divorce, and I always feel so bad talking about this. Um, for my dad because he'll, you know, 
it's one of those things I haven't really gotten around to like sitting down and talking to him about, but I will. Um, so my parents were getting a divorce. My mother was having an affair with my dad's best friend. My dad was having an affair with um, his mistress back in Michigan. We're all living in Orange County at that time. They're both having this like, you know, their affairs with these different people. I'm 16 years old. I'm working in the lingerie store. I have the same boyfriend since I was like 14 years old. Um, you know, I'm living my life. I'm working, I'm going to school, I'm working, I'm hanging out with my boyfriend. I'm not, you know, I'm pretty, I'm not getting amazing grades, but I'm not getting bad grades. I'm not doing anything bad. Um, and I'm working in the lingerie store and I'd wash my little like black lace lingerie things and hang them up in my bathroom. And my dad just had like a fit about it and was calling me, you know, a whore and like whoring around with your boyfriend. And I was sort of like, what? You know, yeah. I was like, I, I I have a credit card. I'm working in a lingerie store selling lingerie to like, you know, grown women. And it's a legitimate, it's not a sex store. Um, it's, it, you know, I'm selling like nightgowns to ladies in their 50s half the time. Uh, so my dad like kind of threw me out of the house. I mean, he was drinking a lot at that time. So I went to go live with my mom, which was better for me because I've always been closer to my mom and... Uh, we've always understood each other a lot better than, you know, dads and daughters don't always understand each other that well. So that's the story of me getting thrown out of the house. <laughs> was that, was that hard for you? I'm just, I mean, I've never been thrown out of a house, man. We've yeah. all, I've, I've certainly had my own childhood stuff, but, uh, was it a, re was it more of a relief than anything? Yeah. Or? It was kind of like, I feel like, I could recognize whatever my parents were going through and that, you know, a divorce is never easy on anyone. And I was sort of like, it's, you know, I was always very like relaxed about things like that. And even looking back, it wasn't traumatic. I sort of just went and lived with my mom and, you know, I had more freedom that way. Uh, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't long after that, that I, uh, you know, moved out you know it was a couple years later that I was kind of on my own and uh yeah I don't I don't know it was more it, it made me think about it a, a few years ago I didn't think about that too much but it made me think about how people have their own associations with certain things and and my association with lingerie and black lace and garter belts and stockings was kind of an innocent one like I said it goes back to that rite of passage of being a woman not sex, you know, certainly I know how to use the tools of seduction and things like lingerie. I know how to use that in my personal life, but, you know, I don't, it's never been that for me. And I thought, oh, that's my dad putting his issues on me. It's not about me. And I still think that, and that's the conversation I need to have with my dad is like, I do understand that something that made him associate black garter belts and late black lace with something bad with a wicked city woman and a prostitute. Um, he was really disturbed by his, you know, 16, 17 year old daughter wearing that stuff. But none of that was my problem. That's his problem. Mm -hmm. How did you develop the capacity to handle all of that as calmly as you did? It was, is your mom that way? Are you, uh, did you somehow develop that over time? I mean, that seems mm. atypical for yeah. a 16 or 17 year old getting thrown out of the house to be, to be able to watch the watcher in a way and have that level of kind of calm awareness. Where, where yeah, does that come I'm, from? I'm not necessarily, sh I'm not really sure if I felt that way at the time, but I think I've always been someone who, you know, kind of disappears into the work, whatever it is. And, um, I kind of, I, I don't, I'm not someone who re reacts unless I'm really like provoked and pushed and then suddenly I can explode. Um, but I certainly wasn't that way when I was a teenager. Uh, I think things would be different now if someone like my dad talked to me and even when he does talk to me now, it, if I, if he says something I don't agree with or that I'm offended by, like I wouldn't be that person that's like, I'm just going to go, um, I'm a little more confrontational with with <laughs> with with my my father uh, now, you know. Mm -hmm. So the, you mentioned the ballet and wanting to be a ballet dancer, and 
I want to come back to that because uh, going back to one of the questions in Tribe of Mentors, I asked, you know, how has a failure or apparent failure set you up for later success? Do you have a, quote, favorite failure, end quote, of yours? And th- there's a lot to the answer, so I'm not going to read all of it, which is a great answer. But uh, you mentioned at one point, you know, truthfully, I never really loved dancing per se. I loved what ballet stood for. And then you went into what that meant. And the, the part I want to highlight here is I believe that sometimes our shortcomings can lead to greatness because those of us who have intense desire but lack natural God-given talent sometimes find roundabout ways of realizing dreams. So this, I think, is really, really, really important. Uh because there are certain places, certain fields of endeavor, certain careers that require mutant-like attributes that you're either mm-hmm. born with or you are born without. I agree. And if, if you want to <laughs> sprint along say, alongside Usain Bolt, good luck. Like You better have some very unusual genetics. Mm-hmm. If you want to be a superstar ballet dancer at the top of the world, Similarly, you need to, there's a certain phenotype, a certain build, and there are attributes that, were, that, that are prerequisites in a lot of respects. You managed to take uh, your abilities in different areas and combine them into something unique. Mm-hmm. Uh, what are other either failures that helped you along the way or uh, key decisions that you think have helped you to craft this very unusual path for yourself? Yeah. um, For some reason, I've always loved people that are, have like shortcomings or when you read, you always read about people's opinions like, Oh, she's not that good of a singer. Why is she the most famous singer in the world? There are better, you know, I always loved those people. Yeah. And so I'm kind of, you know, because I can relate to them, you know, um, and I, I, those are always the kind of singers I like. Like I can't stand listening to vocal gymnastics, like with, when people are like the great singers of today. I like people that have flawed voices or interesting voices that have like commu- that communicate. And I always felt the same way about dance and myself. Like I'm just trying to communicate. I'm trying to be on stage instead of look like I'm trying to dance. You know, I get insulted a lot with, she's not that good of a dancer even. And I like, oh, actually, I probably could be, but I don't want to ever look like I'm trying too hard because to me, like sensuality and eroticism is an epic fail. If you look like you're trying to do it, it's better to do less. Yeah. You know, I mean, for, like, I, I, I even think when I watch someone like Beyonce, her best moments are when she stops, you know, she does all this crazy stuff and then she stops and breathes and you're like, yes, <laughs> do more of that. You know, it's so <laughs> great. Um, so I, I'm, that's, that's just, I think that my failures and not really finding what that thing that I might be amazing at is because I also, I'm always fascinated by what you were saying. Like, how does someone, you think of all these people that are walking around and what if they could have been the greatest whatever, but they were never given the opportunity or they weren't interested in it? Like, what if they could have been the best like basketball player or they could have been the best actor, but like they never had the opportunity or the interest in trying it. And there's yeah. probably people out there with hidden talents that could have been the best in the world and they would never even know it. And I, I think that, you know, why I like this, this answer you gave uh, and this topic is that whether it's people listening, whether it's you and what you've done, uh, you're not limited to 27 preset tracks called careers, right? Like you can be the best in the world, but you have to figure out how to be the best Dita Devontis in the world if yeah. you're Dita Devontis. And you mentioned, you know, people trying to out Dita Dita, like that's never going to fucking work, right? Because but they like, try all the time. They try, but like <laughs> they're they they should race their own race, right? Yeah, it's like yeah, they're they're yeah. they're not going to have the endurance or the enthusiasm or the passion or the lack of attachment that you had in the beginning. Mm-hmm. So they've kind of in in a way already lost, right? Like they're yeah. they're they're trying to dominate in a category of one which is already owned by Dita. And uh, I think quite a bit. I've had uh, two folks on on this podcast, Mark Andreessen, who's a uh, 
very famous entrepreneur and investor, and then Scott Adams, the creator of Dilbert. And both of them have very similar thoughts on building incredible careers or finding your own path, which is, in a sense, and this came from Scott first in his writing, is you can try to be the top 1% of 1% of 1% in one thing, like basketball. Mm -hmm. But you are going to have a hell of a time doing that, and you you are going to be relying heavily on attributes that you are either born with or without. And um, that is a sort of a finite game, in a sense. And then, you, on the other hand, you could combine really unusual... I shouldn't say unusual things. You could take usual things that are usually not combined, like mm -hmm. a law degree and a computer science degree and fill in the blank, a love of Japanese anime. I'm just making that up. Mm -hmm. Now, all of a sudden, you're the one horse in the race. Yeah. Right? <laughs> uh, what other... You, you've mentioned a few of the women who have inspired you. Mm -hmm. Are there any other, uh, whether it's uh, women inside or outside of burlesque or uh, really anywhere who inspire you along those lines, kind of people who have, have carved their own path. You mentioned Madonna earlier. Yeah. This is something I also wanted to mention. Like she's had people throughout her career say, oh, she's not, she doesn't know how to sing. She has no idea how to dance or whatever yeah. it is. Oh, she makes a movie. She can't act. Yeah, she directs the movie. She can't direct. But she's fucking Madonna, right? And yeah. so like, why is she Madonna? Like, that's a really worthwhile question yeah. to ask. For decades, she was Madonna, right? I mean, she still is Madonna, but like she's she's been able to reinvent herself successfully so many times. And it's because she is the best at combining all those disparate yeah, but elements. But not only that, people sometimes forget, and this is the thing that bothers me. She was the first person to sort of like, I'm going to make a music video on stage, and yeah. the shows with all the dancers and, you know, all of it around her. Um, she was the person that was like, I'm going to make this stage show that is like a spectacle. And so every, you know, what bothers me is that you, people definitely have every show. That's the benchmark now. Everyone has to try to have all these dancers. They have to have designers making their outfits. They have to do all this stuff. But sometimes they, these people will forget where, that they wouldn't even, she's the one that paved the way for that and inspired everyone to do that. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, I, it bothers me when somebody doesn't get credit for that, you know? Yeah, for sure. I mean, cause I watch people all the time that are like, they'll imitate one of my shows, but then they act like they never saw me, but they've never heard of me before, yeah. you know, cause there's always that everybody wants to be recognized. They want to be, feel like they did something that was the first thing, you know, and they changed the world. And, but it's honestly like, why don't you do that first, you know? And then you can, instead of just trying to sweep it under the rug that you saw, you know, you saw somebody else do it and mm -hmm. you decided you were going to try to make it better, but you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> no, I agree. I, I totally agree. Are there, what other notable influences have you had? Uh, any gender, any discipline? Uh, has anyone come to mind? There's there's one that I can definitely bring up just uh -huh. because I think she's okay. amazing. But no, no, no. I want to hear... Oh, Madonna. Okay. No, yeah. no. Madonna. Well, that I was, was also, the one. Uh, there, no, well, no. I, I brought her up as, as uh, just someone top of mind that I didn't yeah. want to forget. Uh, well, let's just jump to it. Mae West. Oh, yeah. Mae West. Mae West. Who, uh, who, is, I mean, who she, is Mae West for people who don't know? She's, okay, she was an actress that has, I, I think there's still no one that's ever done what she has. Do you know much about Mae West? Very little other than uh, what you wrote about her okay. just because of her, her <laughs> incredibly well-titled <laughs> book on sex, health, and ESP. Yeah. <laughs> Very yeah. rare book. Yes. Uh, but also her quotes. I've just found her quotes to be so brilliant mm -hmm. uh, in uh, all right I've had a few too many cappuccinos prior to this interview which is why I'm all over the place but I, I just to get it out there so when when I get attacked by someone on the internet usually I don't reply before that I don't even go looking for it but if I just happen to be having a tough day and, and I and I come across someone and feel compelled to feed the trolls uh, I will very often respond. It's usually because I've offended somebody in some ridiculous way. And I'll, I will almost always just reply with a May West quote, mm. which is, those who are shocked easily should be shocked more often. Yeah. <laughs> and I just let her do my speaking for me. But who is who okay, is Mae West? So Mae West is this fascinating. She was the biggest sex symbol in the 1930s. And the things that make her fascinating 
the short version are, number one, she made her first film at age 40, and she was the biggest sex symbol of her time. So that's, imagine that now. (laughs) Also, she wrote every line she ever said in every film. So when you look up Mae West quotes, and you will get like the best quotes ever written, the best one-liners ever written, you know, she is that like, and that's what she said. You know, she's like the originator of that kind of quote. So, and then... She went to the studio bosses when she made her first films and became a sensation. She said, how much does the studio boss get? I want more than that. And she got more than that. And she was the only person. She was the only actor, actress that made more than the studio bosses just because she asked for it and she demanded it. And she was, you know, a a sensation back then. So she was kind of like a sexual gangster too. You know, she was the one that flipped the script. Everything was, you know, women had a certain role in Hollywood and she was kind of like the male version. And she, even when you watch her film, she's objectifying men left and right. It's just, it's astonishing to watch. And I can't think of anyone in history that's done what she's done since. I mean, to to actually write every line in every film um, is kind of, and she made so many films and of course you know she's there there are some of her th- things about her that are prog- problematic because it was a different time but um you what, know what for, kind of stuff is problematic well you know i mean they she she appear i mean there's a great documentary coming out about her i hope people will watch but you know she grew up a lot of people say she appropriated black culture with the, with her like s- her swagger and the way she sang and talked and everything and that was kind of an imprint of childhood because she was actually like a child actor in a minstrel show. So that was kind of like, she just picked it up, you know, and Mm -hmm. turned it into something totally different. So that's, you know, that's one thing, but you know, then we could also argue like she completely swirled it into something new and became Mae West. And, you know, Mae West is like this character that, you know, there's never been another, another one like her. And, you know, she's drag queens do Mae West. Everyone does Mae West. You know, it's like this character that we've never seen again. And and when you squint your eyes, you're like, that's Mae West. So, um, yeah, she's someone I definitely admire. She went to prison for like writing a play about sex. I mean, she was talking, she was sex positive at a time before it was popular. I mean, she wrote a play called Sex. I think she went to prison for like a week, but you know, she loved it because she got to hang around all these other women and write more material. And she felt like she came out better than ever because of it. Workshopped <laughs> yeah. the prison visit. Yeah. So uh, she is a fascinating person. I'm glad they're finally, there's some great books about her. That one of my favorite one is She Always Knew How. Um, but she also wrote. That's the name of the Yeah, book. She Always Knew How. That's a biography about her that I really like. There's several. And of course she wrote an autobiography and if you can ever get your hands on love sex and esp uh, is it love sex okay it's sex health sex health and esp Mm -hmm. sorry Mm -hmm. um that book is great uh i used to read aloud from that book in in paris i'd get my friend i lived in paris for a short time and i'd get my friends together and we'd all drink champagne and read aloud from that book because it's so (laughs) crazy great do you have a favorite any do you have a favorite film of hers um or Not one, really. Or, or it's like one that you would suggest people start with. Mm, it's hard to say. I would suggest anybody interested just go and start watching Mae West clips, like watching some best ofs, like reels of her quick one-liners of the things she would say. Uh, that that's what I would say because it's one of those things where the clips are almost better than the films in their on their own. Mm-hmm. You were just talking about Mae West writing her own lines, and I read something that may or may not be true, you can tell me, do you use stylists or do you not use stylists? I don't in my personal life. Mm -hmm. I am forced to often in my professional life, like for photo shoots for a magazine and whatnot, but I am self-styled. You know, when I go on the red carpet, I I just pull from my own wardrobe or I have direct relationships with the designers. I've, Mm -hmm which has kind of always been, you know, a good a good thing for me is having that direct contact with the people that I want to be dressed by. Um, that whole machine of like hair, makeup, stylist, like I can't, I can't be bothered with all of it. Yeah. I don't need it. I feel like I know if it looks right, it is right. And, um, and also that's kind of what I built my whole career on is being self-made and you know, in my books, empowering other women um, to be able to do whatever I can do. 
I, I don't know if this is apocryphal or if it's a real story, but I, I had read of some stylist picking up some, some very, uh, I suppose, classic vintage shoes and saying, oh, these would go great with jeans. And you're like, okay, I think we're done. <laughs> yeah, this interview is done here. Yeah, um, it was actually... <laughs> Marilyn Manson's stylist when we lived together and she was like oh yeah let's go look in your wardrobe and, and she's a good friend of mine now and it's all fine you know it's just that I always you know I, I figured out early on that I didn't need advice you know I don't I don't need advice on what to wear I know what to wear uh prep for your shows let's talk about prep mm -hmm. so I had read that you arrive sometimes four or five hours in advance of your performances yes, and that you could prep, you could get ready very quickly, but you choose not to. Yeah. It's a nightmare. Why, why, <laughs> why, why do you arrive as someone who arrives to the airport like 17 hours early for domestic flights? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I feel like we might be birds of feather in that respect, but why do you arrive yeah. so early? Well, there are a lot of, you know, yes, I can get ready within a certain time frame, but when you start throwing in all of these things like answering text messages and people asking you questions, you know, when I'm doing my tours, I arrive like five, six hours before because there's things like I want to look at the theater, I need to look at the stage. Sometimes, you know, I need to set where the props are going to go because the stage is a different size than usual. Um, but mostly it's like, why rush? It's part of the fun of it is getting ready. I love listening to music. I love listening to Tim Ferriss podcasts in my dressing room. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> Particularly the ones about psychedelic drugs. <laughs> and uh, and I um, I just like taking my time. You know, there's when you I'm in such a better headspace when I spend much too much time preparing. Um, I have all my, I have a lot of bad experiences with being rushed i mean most recently i was performing at um this party for anastasia of beverly hills and it was like all the kardashians in presence and i was sort of like in the dressing room and there were some kardashians in there <laughs> and i was like too many being kind of bombarded and ru and and you know i get really stressed out when i'm being rushed you know to yeah. get ready and i kind of got like can you go on stage in 15 minutes and i was like Ah, you know, it's not how I want to do it. That's not the yeah. way that I want to feel. I don't want to feel stressed out or rushed or like, you know, because I feel like that's when I start getting in my head and I'll be like, I'm not good. And, you know, all the bad things in my head, like I'm not good enough. Yeah, I can't. I don't know what I'm doing. They're going to find out I'm pretending to do this. They're going to find out I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I uh, the the on ramp to a lot of these experiences for me is as important as the so-called performance segment, right? Yes, it's like yeah. the, I have always arrived so early. I mean, this is this, where we're sitting right now is a, is a, is a case in point, right? I mean, I'm, I'm here for a 45 or 60 minute panel tomorrow. I could have arrived a few hours beforehand, mm -hmm. But I want to know the venue. I want to feel comfortable in the time zone. I want to know what I'm going to be having for breakfast so that I don't have any snafus. I want to mm -hmm. know if the mini bar has like snacks. I want to know all of those details, even though I will probably not need any of those contingency plans. It just gives me a level of calm mm -hmm. and feeling as though I've checked the boxes so that the only thing occupying my mind is what I am going to do once I get on stage. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, and I, 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 I have friends. I envy them who like they they almost make it a game to see how close they can cut it at the airport with yeah. their flights. I that is so much. It's just so anathema to my programming. Uh, I think it makes a whole lot of sense to arrive really, really, really early. So for those people who are making stress a sport with things like uh, transportation. I encourage you like consider the alternative, which is not arriving just like an hour beforehand, but like with an excess of time. Yeah. Right? Stress sport is a good word. Yeah. 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 Who needs it? Who needs it? Yeah. Um, there's enough unavoidable, unpredictable stress. It's mm -hmm. like, I, I feel no compulsion to add uh, optional stress. Yeah of my own volition. What, uh, 
what would you say are any behave, new behaviors or beliefs that have really positively impacted your life in the last year, two, or three? Is there any, anything that you've really changed for yourself, uh, added or removed, that has had a significant impact on your well-being, would you say? Um, well, I know a lot of people say this, but learning to meditate, mm -hmm. um, which I'm not a good, great, amazing model meditator. I use it when I need it, mm -hmm. and that's kind of helped me in a, in a lot of ways. Um, what type uh, of meditation? Or transcendental how do you meditate? meditation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I feel like when I, you know, it was always intimidating to me. I think I dropped into like a Buddhist meditation center once and I was like, oh my God, sitting here for an hour with no thoughts. And it scared me away. And then yep. someone introduced me to transcendental meditation. And I learned with this amazing lady um, and she, you know, she had all these great stories about teaching Elizabeth Taylor to meditate and um, Michael Jackson and all these people. And she had great stories. So it made it fun for me too, to see her uh, for all the training yeah. uh, every day. I was like, Oh, what story are you going to tell me now? So, um, and then she also just took the pressure off. And, and, and when I would say like, I don't think I can sit there for 20 minutes twice a day. She said, why don't you try 10? And I was like, okay. <laughs> so having that pressure off and yeah. even now just realizing five minutes is good, that, yeah. that seemed to help a lot. And I, I'm, I'm trying to be better at it. And it's yeah. something that gives me a goal to, to achieve to like, to try to, to make sure I block out the time. What differences have you seen since starting to experiment with the meditation? Um, well, I think it's mostly like regaining focus, mm -hmm. um, and having I also, besides like transcendental meditation and clearing my mind, I also love to uh, schedule like a massage or something that puts me in a relaxed state, but still a thinking state. Because mm -hmm. um, I don't like, I, it's not like I'm trying to just tune out. Then I start like actually thinking about what I'm going to do. That's where I come up with my good ideas where I'm like, what, what's my new tour going to be called? And I love, so I love to set out aside that time of not doing and racing around and not, you know, trying to accomplish things and just like, I'm going to lay here for an hour and think about this thing that I need to figure out. Hmm. I can do that at the dentist too sometimes actually. At the dentist. Yeah, I kind of don't mind really going to the <laughs> dentist. Um, and it kind of makes me close my eyes and like think about things. Yeah. Um, yeah, so so it's, it's more like taking a time out because I have always these to-do lists and I feel, realize I'm, you know, trying to chip away at it and doing too many things. And I think I just need to, it makes my life better when I stop and I, um, focus, uh, you know, clear my mind, close my eyes, meditate. Um, yeah. Yeah. The transitional meditation is, is a fantastic option for people who have developed, uh, a very well earned, I think, uh, or well deserved on the part of meditation allergy to meditation because um, the way that meditation is often sold is very all or nothing and extremely intimidating. Right? Mm -hmm. Like, all right, you're going to sit on this hard floor for an hour with a perfectly straight back and do X. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas TM, especially with a good teacher, can keep lowering the bar until it's easy to step over. It's not something you have to do, you know, Olympic, uh, high jump over. <laughs> yeah. They, they make it less and less intimidating until you can get started. Right. Yeah. And then once you're sitting there for 10 minutes, you're like, oh, okay. And I know yeah. oftentimes you're like, okay, I can, I can go 15. Okay. Yeah. I can go 20, but it's really just getting your ass to sit down yeah. and do it. And the first, like for me, the first five minutes is brutal. And then yeah. suddenly I go into like the zone. I'm like, Oh yeah, this is what I came here for. Yeah. And it really does as a mantra based concentration practice, train you right? at least this has been my experience. You said helping with focus to return to something over and over again. Uh, and like you, you'll end up drifting off and thinking about your to-do list or porn or whatever. And then you're like, oh, wait, I'm supposed to be meditating. And then you go back to your <laughs> mantra. And when you sit down in front of a computer, you sit down with a notebook. That's also what you're going to be doing, right? So it's like the reeling back is the repetition of lifting the weight in the gym. And uh, it's, it's a very 
it's a very beneficial gateway drug into meditation, yeah. I think. I also love taking a time out during the day actually by myself and sipping a little magic mushroom tea and going, <laughs> oh, okay, this is what, you know, kind of gets to the essence of things, like a simplistic <laughs> appreciation for the beauty of the world. I'll just, yeah. you know, I can look in the garden and I'm like, oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, do this once in a while. <laughs> that'll definitely do it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what, uh, now there's, there's, advice I referred to earlier to your younger self and uh, the, the, the advice that you gave in Tribe of Mentors was, actually, no, it wasn't in Tribe of Mentors. I take it back. This was in an interview. Uh, was in effect to, to be a little bit more vigilant, right? To, to look over your books, to pay attention yeah. uh, so that you wouldn't be taken advantage of. Mm-hmm. Uh, because the world we live in, it's full contact, you know, for better or for worse, if you're going to be on the playing field, like there are going to be people who want to separate you from <laughs> your mm-hmm. money and many other things. Uh, is there, is there any other advice that you would give to your actually, yes, to your, to your younger self and, and you can pick the age. So mm-hmm. that's the thing. So it could be okay. yourself of five years ago, could be yourself at age six, it could be any age. Uh, how old would you be and what advice would you give that version of yourself? I think in my mid twenties, I would have told myself to try to maybe buy a house. Like even if it was something small, Mm -hmm. I would have done that. Um, And I would have also warned myself about signing model releases because although there are lots of people that really like are kind and like, did, you know, I didn't know I was going to be famous, but there are some people that took advantage of that. Yeah. You know, like suddenly I was in ad campaigns with, without, you know, with a watch photoshopped on my hand because someone took a portrait of me when I was like 25 and then they used it 10 years later. So there were things like that, which, you know, I just, I didn't really, you know, I didn't have any anticipation that that kind of thing would happen to me. I was just like, oh yeah, that's fine. I'm sign whatever was in front of me. Um, but you know, I guess people could have taken advantage of me no matter what, yeah. <laughs> if they wanted. What, um, what advice do you think yourself 10 years from now would give your current self? Oh, no one's ever asked that. Um, gosh, it's hard to take advice from your younger self. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, well, hmm. if you were giving, uh, if, if you're older self we're giving your current self advice meaning you right now we're getting advice from your older self what do you Mm. think your older self would say oh god i'm worried that my i'm worried that my older self might say that i should have had a child Mm. i'm concerned about that you know Mm. i'm not concerned about right now yeah but sometimes i go oh god i really hope that doesn't happen Mm. And then I think, well, there's always remedies for that too, though. You know, yeah. there's, you could adopt any time, you know, because mm-hmm. um, it's really one of those things where I never, sometimes I wish when it comes to children and people that have children, I don't really envy any of my friends with children except for adult children. I'm like, mm-hmm. oh, that's so cool. That you have this great adult child that's doing amazing things that is probably fun to hang out with. But it doesn't always work out like that, you know? Yeah. It doesn't always work out like that. So um you know, I just it's hard when you're in the line of work that I'm in, you know, uh I can't think of a time where I ever could have stopped and said, Oh, I think I'll just have a baby. And then I think about who I would have had a baby with back then. Like probably not the best idea. Yeah. So, you know, it's a real, it's a, (laughs) what can you do? You know, I, I feel like I chose my path. I don't necessarily feel like it's the right time for everyone to bring children into the world in any way, but, Mm -hmm. mm. (laughs) No, I think I think that you know I I have friends who have kids who are very happy. I have friends who have kids who are totally miserable, and I have friends yeah. without kids who are both very happy and some who are very miserable. Right. So yeah, I think yeah. it's kind of another variable. Are you having children? Interested? You know, I appreciate you asking. Uh, I don't have kids that I'm aware of currently. I. <laughs> did not plan there there's a long period of time where I did not plan on having kids in part because I was afraid of fucking them up mm. in some way. 
uh, and that I felt like the risk that the decision to bring a child into the world was inherently a selfish one, uh-huh. uh, in a way, mm-hmm. right? Like you're not doing it for your kids in a sense, you're doing it because right. you want kids. Yeah. Number one. And that if there were potential risk of, or almost a guarantee that you're going to damage your kids in some way. And certainly I don't know anyone who's made it out of childhood unscathed. <laughs> like, <Right. there's, laughs> like shit goes sideways mm-hmm. that I, I didn't feel like that was a, a risk I wanted to take. Mm-hmm. If that makes any sense. Uh, I've started to feel differently about it. Uh, is it because you're newly in love though? Cause that's the thing you got to get past that like new love thing. And then, yeah. No, yeah, because it's like a sci- science of like I should have a baby. I'm yeah, love. you get kind of slap happy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I I am with a wonderful woman, my girlfriend. Uh, that's a, that's a piece of it for sure. Uh, I think that also uh, I've done uh, just a lot of work in the last mm-hmm. handful of years and have come to a place where I feel confident that i could be a at the very least like a a b plus parent Mm -hmm. i don't know if i'd be an a plus parent but i think i could be at least a b plus parent and also i think that uh there may just be a like biological imperative and sort of existential itch Mm -hmm. that is hard to scratch without having kids right Mm -hmm. so that you know, a friend of mine said to me recently, he said, you can find meaning by finding God or having kids, having kids is easier. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, so there, there may be an element of sort of inevitability in, in a sense, but I I think I've also just come to accept that part of the human experience is making mistakes. And if the, every parent makes mistakes and Mm -hmm. is going to, condition their kids in ways they don't want to consciously or, or uh, I should say subconsciously. And that if you're going to sign up for having kids, you should just accept on the front end that you're mm-hmm. going to do damage and hopefully yeah. you can help them undo it later and you'll have a, a level of self-awareness to do that. So uh, I would lean my, like the have kids o meter is is kind of <laughs> leaning more towards having kids yeah it moves point. a lot for me or, yeah. yeah but ultimately i just think mostly about like adoption or you know yeah i love animals me too you know? <laughs> yeah me too uh, it's not i know it's not the same thing but it is like you know <laughs> I've, yeah, no, it's not the same thing, it's but the, the same this thing, is going to piss off a lot of I parents. Know. It, it, but it's not the same thing, but there are a lot of parallels. This is going to upset a lot of folks. <laughs> I know. Because they're like, little children are not animals or whatever. Mm-hmm. I'm like, mm-hmm. actually, they technically are exactly animals, uh, being mammals and all. And uh, there's, a, there's a great book called Don't Shoot the Dog, which is terribly titled, but a fantastic book on... In effect, um, training of mammals. And it talks a lot about, I'm going to get so much shit for this, but that's okay. Training of dolphins, because Mm -hmm. you can only really effectively use positive reinforcement with, Mm -hmm. say, dolphins or aquatic mammals, because you're not going to hit them with a rolled up newspaper. Like, it doesn't work. (laughs) They're just going to swim away from you. So you have to get very good at using uh, cues, like a whistle or something like that, to indicate the behavior as a marker and then rewarding. And it turns out you can use that for training just about anything. Mm -hmm. And one of the quotes, I believe it was in that book that I loved so much was, you know, if you can't train a chicken, you shouldn't be allowed to have a child. (laughs) And I tend to believe that. It's like if if you're not, if you can't be aware of your impact on another animal and how it shapes that animal's behavior, Mm -hmm. I don't think... In, on some level, and of, of course, legally, this has no holds no water whatsoever. But ethically, you, perhaps you shouldn't be allowed to have kids. Like you should be able to pass mm-hmm. that test. And I have a dog now. Uh, adopted her a few years ago, about three, three and a half years ago. And so I've I've satisfied for myself that I can at least keep a medium sized mammal alive and healthy. Mm-hmm 
for that period of time. <laughs> and um, so we'll see. Anyway, I'm talking too much, but I think that's in part because it's it's been on the brain. And like you, it it flips and flops. Yeah. Like when I go to the airport and I see like kids having a complete meltdown and their parents like pulling their hair out and just having a hellish time of going through the process. I'm like, I am not sure. <laughs> yeah, I just think like, also I have been asked about it my whole adult life. And I think, wow, what a, you know, in, in interviews. And I just always thought like, what if you were asking someone that could not have children, yeah. you know, and yeah. why do we have to put so much emphasis on if you don't have children, you're not, your life isn't full and you haven't done the most important job there is in the world because there are lots of people that can't have children for different yeah. reasons. Does that make them less of a person? So that's one of the problems I have with people always putting so much emphasis on the importance of yeah. being a mother. It's like, it's kind of, when you think about it, you know, it's kind of not very cool to ask people about that or to make that statement that, um, that it's the most important job in the world. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think it should be the number one priority for everyone. I don't think any one thing should be that I can think of should be the number one priority for mm -hmm. everyone. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. And like you said, there yeah. are many cases in which for physical, medical or other reasons, it's, it makes a whole lot of sense mm -hmm. not to, uh, not to take the sort of biological birthing route or necessarily adopt, right? Like mm -hmm. I know people who, uh, I made friends of my parents and others who went their entire lives without kids and had very, very deep, rich, fulfilling lives mm -hmm. and did a lot of good in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, in my case, TBD, yeah. still TBD. One thing I love in life is knowing women much older than me and asking for their advice. Um, like the thing that you asked me about earlier about watching my finances, that advice came from um, 1950s movie star and pinup model who's still around now, uh, Mamie Van Doren. She's like a blonde bombshell. She was kind of like a Marilyn Monroe, but... Um, Anyway, she was, she was a big star back then. But anyway, I know her and I love to sit down with her and have her give me advice. And that was one of her things. It's like, watch your money. I know it's not fun. And it's not fun to look at numbers and challenge people, but watch it all. And she also had said to me, she has an, uh, one son. And she was like, I love my son, but it wasn't the most important thing I did in life. It wasn't, it's not something you have to do if you don't feel inclined. And she said, and if I'm looking at the world today, the way I'm looking at the world today as ha compared to how it was in the 50s and 60s and 70s, she's like, I wouldn't do it now. Mm. So I thought that was interesting. I like talking to people. I have another friend named Alona Roy Smithskin who's 100 years old. And I love getting on the phone with her and hearing, she still has amazing advice. She and was, uh, any advice come to mind that she's given From you? her, well, she... She just has little pearls of wisdom. She has an Instagram that I love to follow, and she just puts it out there all the time about mostly. <laughs> she's a hundred and has. A, she's a hundred, yeah, she does, and she well, she's an amazing lady. She has, she's. Uh, I I learned about her from a book called Advanced Style by my friend Ari Seth Cohen. I don't know if you've heard about this book, mm -hmm. but it's about. Um, he was obsessed with finding older ladies that dress in eccentric ways and wear eccentric makeup. Um, and that are, you know, fashion icons in their own right, eccentric people. Um, and I learned about her because she had, she's like four feet tall. She has this flaming orange hair and she makes her own eyelashes, like long red eyelashes, blue eyeshadow. And she's an artist and she's, you know, she has a show, I think too, like she's a singer, um, like in, in uh, really? Provincetown. And anyway, she's like, she's what was her amazing. name again? Her name's Ilona Royce Smithskin. Oh boy. How do you spell Ilona? I, I L O N A. Yeah. All right. Ilona. And we'll put it in the show notes as well Okay. for her Instagram and so on. Yeah. All right. But she's an amazing, but his book in general is amazing because it spotlights all these like, you know, elderly people. And, you know, there's a lot of talk about you shouldn't wear that because you're of a certain age, you, you know, and these are ladies that are colorful and amazing and fashion icons and living their lives. And I think it's important to like, you know, have people like this spotlighted you know i was just actually reading this horrific article yesterday that my friend liz goldwin pointed out to me um this writer um she was actually an editor at vogue and i was so i was shocked that she wrote something like this she was 
saying that uh, Helena Christensen, who's 50, went to a party and she was wearing jeans and a strapless bustier. And she said it was completely inappropriate um, for her to be flaunting that much skin at her age. And mind you, she looks fantastic. When I'm hearing about this article, I Googled it, you know, and I read it. It's a Daily Mail article, which is obviously clickbait, so I chose not to share it because I was like, oh, yes, I'm, I'm f- offended and outraged, but that's exactly what they want from us. <laughs> yeah, <totally. laughs> they want me to have everyone read it and be outraged. Um, but I did find it disturbing because they were basically saying, she was saying that once you're past childbearing age, you're, you know, you shouldn't be wearing clothes like that or you should, you know, pay, open, you know, the, you know pay the, let, let the other, the young people have their chance. And I mean, if you can see this picture of Helena Christensen, you'd be like, she looks so hot and she's perfect. And she says things in this article like, no matter how invisible your bingo wings are. I don't even know what that means. Well, you know, like when, you know, this, what is that? Oh, your tricep? Yeah, your, your tricep. What is that? <laughs> yeah. But I was like, what are you talking about? And they, she said that it's okay for men because they can procreate at any age, essentially. But once you are, you know, beyond childbearing years you shouldn't dress like that and i just found it amazing that she used to be the editor of, in at british vogue wow it's a for very like Victorian in the 90s perspective on it was um, really shocking and you know anyway i just so, it, it's a real interesting conversation though about like ageism yeah. and and how how uh you know we're we treat women of a certain age and it's one of those things that i feel like it's important to stand up for i almost retired a few years ago thinking like oh i should i'm 40 i should stop doing striptease what if i don't look as good as i used to and then i thought like wait you have to i have female followers and i have to stand for something and i think it's important to have examples of eroticism and sensuality in all different phases of life and to set examples for that because i look to people that are older than me um like jennifer lopez and you know gwen stefani and all these people that i'm like oh she's sexy you know like i can be like that too so i think it's important as much as it's an you know it's not always easy and you open yourself up to criticism. It's important to some people to see examples of this. So here, here. Well, Dita, this has been so fun. I uh, really appreciate you taking the time and we're going to link to everything that you mentioned in the show notes so people can find all of that very easily. And for people listening, that's just a tim.blog forward slash podcast. And if you search Dita, D I T A, it'll pop right up. Now, I mentioned the social accounts where people can learn uh, what you're up to, see what you're up to, also more accurately, in terms of at Dita Von Tees on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Are you more active on one than the others? I'm mostly active on Instagram, I have to say, but right. I definitely use Facebook and a little bit of Twitter. I can't help it. It was the first one. Still good. <laughs> <laughs> and I... Uh, do you have any current projects or upcoming projects that you would like people to check out or keep an eye out for? Yeah. Um, well, I have my lingerie line, which is at like Bloomingdale's and Nordstrom and a lot of online retailers. Um, I'm working on another book called Fashioning the Femme Total, which will come out. It's a follow-up to my um, my beauty book that I, that I wrote. And that one will come out, uh, I think, in September 2020. And this year, I'm touring with a new show, uh, kicking off in Australia in November and then doing like eight weeks in Europe, uh, March, 2020 through April. And then I think I'll do the U S sometime in 2020 as well. Well, you have a very exciting year, two years and many years ahead of you. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time. Oh, thanks for talking to me. This is really (laughs) fun. Do you have any closing comments, requests, Anything at all that you'd like to say before we wrap up? I can't think of anything. <laughs> <laughs> which is which is the most uh, common response. That's what everyone uh, says I th- I think we know. covered plenty. And uh, I really hope people uh, stay tuned. And I will provide everything that we spoke about in the show notes, as I mentioned. So thanks to you for being here. And thanks to everyone for tuning in. And until next time, craft your own path. Do not try to be the best of someone else. Try to discover and also piece together the unique path that only you can forge. So on that note, until next time, 
Bye bye. Hey guys, this is Tim again. Just a few more things before you take off. Number one, this is Five Bullet Friday. Do you want to get a short email from me? Would you enjoy getting a short email from me every Friday that provides a little morsel of fun before the weekend? And Five Bullet Friday is a very short email where I share the coolest things I've found or that I've been pondering over the week. That could include favorite new albums that I've discovered. It could include gizmos and gadgets and all sorts of weird shit that I've somehow dug up in the uh, the world of the esoteric as I do. It could include favorite articles that I've read and that I've shared with my close friends, for instance. And it's very short. It's just a little tiny bite of goodness before you head off for the weekend. So if you want to receive that, check it out. Just go to fourhourworkweek.com. That's fourhourworkweek.com all spelled out and just drop in your email and you will get the very next one. And if you sign up, I hope you enjoy it. This episode is brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs. Hiring can be hard, really hard. And it can also be super, super expensive and painful if you get it wrong. I certainly have had that experience firsthand multiple times, and I am not eager to repeat it. So I try to do as much vetting as possible on the front end. And today, with more qualified candidates than ever, you need a solution. You need a platform that helps you to find the right people for your business. LinkedIn Jobs does exactly that. More than 600 million users visit LinkedIn to learn, make connections, grow as professionals, and more than ever, discover new job opportunities. In fact, overall, LinkedIn members add 15 new skills to their profiles and apply to 35 job posts every two seconds. That's a crazy stat. LinkedIn does the legwork to match you to your most qualified candidates so that you can focus on the hiring process, getting the person into your company who will transform your business. They make sure your job post gets in front of the people with the right hard skills and soft skills to meet your requirements. They've made it as easy as possible. So check it out. To get $50 off of your first job post, go to linkedin.com slash Tim. Again, that's linkedin.com slash Tim to get $50 off of your first job post. Terms and conditions apply. But check it out, linkedin.com slash Tim. This episode of the Tim Ferriss Show is brought to you by Athletic Greens. I get asked all the time, if I could only take one supplement, what would it be? The answer is inevitably Athletic Greens. I view it as, and a lot of you now view it as, all-in-one nutritional insurance. I recommended it way back in 2010 in the 4-Hour Body, and I did not get paid to do so. I've been using it since before that, and I use it in a lot of different ways. I travel with it to avoid getting sick or to help mitigate the likelihood of getting sick. I take it in the morning to ensure optimal performance, and overall, it covers my bases if I can't get what I need from whole food meals throughout the rest of the day. And if you want to give Athletic Greens a try, they're offering a free 20-count travel pack for first-time users. I nearly always travel with at least three or four of these one-dose bags. In other words, if you buy Athletic Greens as a first-time buyer, you now get for a limited time, an extra $79 in free product. So check out the details at athleticgreens.com forward slash Tim. Again, that's athleticgreens.com forward slash Tim for your free travel pack with any purchase.